<laughs> yes. Um, so I'm going to stand in and talk about some coastal resource management things that maybe you guys haven't otherwise covered with him. Um, two of you are also in um, Dr. Claire Steele's beach class. So you guys can either stick around and get a refresher with like the same pictures and bad jokes. Or I'm cool if you want to sneak away. I won't hold against you at all. But this is pretty much the same stuff because things happen on short notice and and that's the way that's the way we gotta roll sometimes. Uh, so what I want to talk about in particular uh, with regard to coastal resource management uh, is some of the different ways that we study it and think about it um, and some other kinds of coastal resources that are not like fisheries but are in some places like California where we live really important. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular I like to think about how we get access to those resources and what, what that means. Um, who has access to what and why and how. Right. Uh, and this is how you get a hold of it. Okay. Um, so, first, I'm just curious. We, we all ESRM? Anybody who's not? No. That's cool. What, what, what are you? Bio. Bio. Bio? Okay. This is going to be not very biological. So, maybe it'll be horizon expanding for you. Are you in class class two or are you just getting more comfortable? No, that's cool. Um, well, see you later. Then. Uh, I write that guy's name down. Um, so I know most of you really quickly. We just do names really quickly. The people that I don't know, starting in the back corner, zipping around your table. Yeah. TJ. TJ. James. James. We got James. Ben. Michael. Michael. Walker. Walker. Jamie. Jamie. Um, Jeff. Alicia. Adrian. <laughs> Julian. Second. <laughs> Josiah. Josiah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, and Raul. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, I haven't met everybody yet. I'm still working on it. Um, I'm curious, all of you are from California? No. Anybody not from California? Ohio. Ohio. Uh, but you've been here for a while. Too long. Too long. <laughs> um, okay. This will be California focused, which is good because that's where we all are. So what I want to talk about today is the coastal, the human dimensions of coastal resource management, and I'll, I'll define that for you. Uh, and so this is going to be in part sort of what this means and what it means in California to be part how we study it and try to understand it and why it matters. Um, so my objective today is for you to come away kind of understanding a little bit about what this means um, and understanding it in kind of maybe a slightly broader context that embraces both you know, the ecosystems and what's happening out in the ocean and along the coast, uh, but also the social system, which in California is sort of us and our society and how we live with our coast and why it matters to us and how we take care of it or not. So in part a little bit of specifics and in part I want you to sort of appreciate them in this larger social ecological context. Um, so just to unpack human dimensions a little bit, uh, I thought I would start quickly with my own so just to give you a sense of how I come to be thinking about this kind of topic. Um, so I started my career uh, on the ecosystem side, so marine biology and oceanography. Uh, it was really fun, pretty much my number one motivation. Uh, really fun and really interesting. And uh, oops, I, I did a lot of work trying to understand uh, how we understand how healthy ecosystems are or are not. Like how do you actually measure, is this a healthy ecosystem, yes or no? And uh, I was working on a, on, a, on a PhD in oceanography and studying coral reef ecosystems and uh, whether they were healthy or not. And I realized that, well, it's one thing to know whether or not they're healthy, but then it's another thing to actually do something about it. And so the questions I was trying to ask sort of went from 
something about the ecology to something about the, the coastal societies that were impacting the coral reefs. And I started asking the question, what, what are they doing? What could they be doing differently? How can we influence that? And everybody in oceanography program for those, are, those are good questions, but that's not oceanography. That's something else. And so I, I transitioned from ecosystems because that's, that's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. So you've got to understand what's happening out there, but it doesn't tell you how to fix it. It doesn't necessarily tell you why it's happening. Uh, so I left that program. I moved to Washington, D.C., and I worked on Capitol Hill um, for a couple of years doing ocean and coastal policy to try to understand how were the decisions being made, what were the rules, what were the laws, what were the policies, what is happening in society that might be affecting the coral reefs, and what could we do about it to maybe try to fix this problem of the coral reefs were in trouble. And so I started to try to learn something about the governance of those ecosystems, and this diagram will begin to make more sense in just a minute. Uh, but it turns out that, that, wasn't, that wasn't really the whole story either, because Politics is complicated. Governance is complicated. It's one thing to understand sort of the rules in D.C. and who's making them, who's implementing them, um, but it's not always a straight line from there to ecosystems. Uh, it's not the whole story, right? So you got to understand a little bit about the ecosystem. You got to understand a little bit about how, what are the rules, what are the policies of which we manage ecosystems. But more importantly, we have to understand what society is doing this bigger picture of how societies are making decisions about what kind of governance to create or implement or enforce or not, what they're doing that might have an impact that may or may not yet be the subject of some sort of governance regime, and how that reflects in ecosystems. And so this is this sort of big, complex wheel where we are having impact. Sometimes they're good, but often they're bad. And on the other side of that, we're getting something back, whether it's food from fisheries or oxygen from algae or you know, sunsets from a coastal state next to a big ocean. Uh, so there's this complicated feedback. And we want to understand how these things all fit together to try to make a difference here. You have to understand how it all fits together. And so this is what, to so understanding how that all fits together is what we call the human dimensions of a system. So understanding how we affect them and how it affects us. And so my focus, our focus today is going to be on the coast. How do we affect the coast? How is the coast affecting us? Uh, my supposition is that we spent a lot of time, uh, we probably spent a lot of time in a class like this one studying, for example, things like fisheries and learning some of the governance structures for how we decide how much fish to catch versus leaving the ocean, and maybe the impacts we're having on that system, and maybe something about the, the social benefits of having active fisheries and working the waterfronts. Right. So these all these things fit together, but to see the whole picture, you have to ask different kinds of questions about different parts of this really complicated system. Uh, and so. Since I left DC, I've been trying to focus on the whole system, which is sort of a fun interdisciplinary challenge. And it's part social science, it's part political science, it's part ecological science, which is biology, ecology, and oceanography. Uh, and it's fortunate that you are in a place like this, which has a program like PSRM that actually embraces that interdisciplinary way of thinking, because it doesn't always go over so well. Uh, human dimensions of coastal resource management is a, is a, is a burdensome phrase, so I'm, I'm, I'm an embarking on, on, a, on an effort, on an effort to redefine this as coastography. So people are like, what are you? I can be a coastographer as opposed to someone who studies the human dimensions of coastal resource management. Um, so this is a word that I made up, and I'm hoping that with your help, maybe it'll catch on someday. This is how I define the science of the coast, associated social biological system including all of the things in, in that Venn diagram that we were just looking at. Um, and there's, you don't have to write this down, because I really, I, I made this up. No one, knows, <laughs> no one else knows about this. Um, but I think this would be a thing. Um, and I think that we need to understand this sustainably, because we're stuck here. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we don't do a better job with understanding and managing this system than what all we do. 
So um, that's sort of who I am and where I got to what I do, which I would like to define as who's time. Um, so that's human dimensions. Uh, we talk about coastal resources. What, what, what have you guys talked about in this class? What kind of coastal resources? You know, uh, fisheries. Yeah, fisheries and? Culture. Culture, could you elaborate? Um, well, you can cover more. You've been elaborating on the type of aquifers. Okay, think about it. What else? So, fisheries. Water. water. What kind of water? Uh, well, preferably fresh water, something like uh, desalinization. Okay. And properties of water. Yeah. Gotcha. Coastal well, threats. Coastal threats, threats to seafood and wetlands and water. Mm -hmm. And public opinion. In what sense? How is that a coastal resource? Well, just how how, how the coastal populations feel about all these mm -hmm. and like how educated they are about oh, we're the issues. Of that. That's mm -hmm. Kind of more on the social side. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So this is what Google thinks about what are coastal resources. Well, these Google images. This is what this is what the Google image search turns up for these things. So we got some some coral reef, some fish, some sandy beach, and some barrier reefs. This is maybe I don't know Tahiti. A lot of coral reefs. Wetlands. Some water treatment. Yep, definitely some wetlands, some mangrove, some fishing, a sea turtle, more wetlands. This also looks like this part of Tahiti. Anyway, more fishing. Uh, I think the typically when people think about what is a coastal resource, they think about those things that are extractable. Right. We extract fish. What are we extracting off the coast in the Santa Barbara Channel? Oil. Oil. Uh, we mine sand and gravel. Uh, some some cultures catch sea turtles. Some cultures catch take other things besides fish. Obviously, crustaceans, mollusks, uh, but extractable things. Uh, but I'm I'm really interested in on sort of the the non-extractable things. So, yeah, what's what are those beaches good for? Surfing, surfing, sitting on a towel, right? So I, I, I am interested in this as a resource, whether it's sort of on the, the dry and damp side or in the near shore side, uh, because in some places like California, this is a really important resource. So maybe we could pull out our 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 Webster's dictionary and cool about like what is a resource. But I think that if this many people are making the effort to go into this ecosystem to spend a lot of time in it, and they're buying umbrellas and towels and, and, and swimsuits and sunscreen and recreational toys, they, that this this to me is is, is a resource. Um, but it's a really, really important resource. Uh, so it's not it's not a given that people just get to come and utilize this resource. I just want to just give you three quick little anecdotes, historical anecdotes. Some of you in my land use class have seen some of these before. Uh, so a little bit of historical context, and then we'll kind of tie this together. Uh, so this is Dana Point in 1933. Uh, Dana Point is the southern end of Orange County, um, the north end of San Diego County. Um, and this was a surf spot in Dana Point called Killer Dana, which was sort of like the Rincon of Southern California. It was a really famous, beautiful surf spot. And a couple dozen surfers in California in this era all really raved about the quality of this particular surf spot. Um, and during sort of the golden age of surfing in California, it was a really central place. Uh, but in 1966, the Army Corps of Engineers started uh, dredging and piling up riprap and building Dana Point Harbor. So here's the point out here that used to be the surf spot, and now there's a, a thriving harbor. And so this, this surf spot, this surf spot called Killer Dana, is, is gone now. Instead, we have, we have a harbor. And that's sort of a little anecdote one. Um, anecdote two, this is Martin's Beach, which is in San Mateo County um, on the north central coast. Has anyone ever been up there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really beautiful little corner of the coast. It's a spectacular little pocket beach, high bluffs. Uh, and it's been a, an important little local destination in this area for a really long time. Since people, I love this, since people wore bow ties for a day at the beach. 
Uh, and what happened was uh, Silicon Valley billionaire uh, bought the property, and it's the, it's a private road. It goes through the property down to the beach, and he closed the road. So for almost 100 years, the public had been using this road to get to this beach, and he bought the property and said, no more. Uh, beach closed, keep out. And people were understandably really concerned about this, since people had been going to this beach for, for literally decades. Uh, a bunch of surfers got arrested for trespassing. A number of lawsuits started making their way through the court system to force this private landowner to open up this fence on his property to allow the general public to use his private road to access the beach. Does anyone in my land use class want to update us on what is the current public status of this? Do you remember what the last thing we heard? They had to open it because yeah. uh, it's still being processed. Like yeah. Permitting. Yeah. So he he didn't apply for a permit to close the beach and to close the road. And we've got a nice law in California we're going to come back to, which says that if you're going to change the intensity of use or access on the coast, you need a permit. Uh, and you didn't get one, so they said go back and get a permit. And until then, you need to open the open the beach. I opened the road. And so there were some countersuits and back and forth. And currently there's a, a cease and desist order that says it must keep it open or, or be fined. And this will probably this very well could make its way um, to the Supreme Court because it's a sort of pitting the public versus private property owners. And there are a number of organizations that are really interested in the fundamental legal questions there. So this is kind of anecdote two. Uh, there they are saying open Martin's speech. Um, then there's one more. This is a much more local case study. This is this is Broad Beach in Malibu. I, I like Broad Beach. It's the most ironically named beach in California because Broad Beach is no longer broad um, as a result of sea level rise and a number of other uh, coastal management decisions that have affected both what happens at the, the, the landward end of this beach in terms of how people are protecting the shoreline with various stabilization devices that you should learn about from Dr. Ethan Patch. Um, we wrote a great book about it, um, and other coastal sediment management issues and uh, and actions we've taken on the coast that are over decades, for example, damming rivers, preventing sediment from coming down the coastal watershed into the coastal zone. Broad Beach has eroded and is no longer broad. It is very, very narrow. Uh, and so if you are the general public and you want to go to this beach, um, who from my land use class went to this beach at high tide? How, where'd you put your towel? No, now you didn't, why not? There was no beach. <laughs> right, okay. So what are these three stories, kind of what, what connects these? So yeah, what's the common thread? Uh, and for me it's this, yeah, so that is definitely part of it. For me, it is this: the thread is is the idea of access. So, who has access to coastal resources? In this case, we're going to yeah, indeed, and we're going to come to that. So, in this case, the surfers lost their access; the boaters gained it. So, there's there's pros and cons of very different populations. Um, here we see the general public lose access, but one very wealthy person gets, or is at least trying to have his own personal private access. Um, and here, uh, a bunch of coastal property owners are protecting their homes at the expense of our ability to access this coastline. Um, and that's just part of this bigger, more complicated situation on the coast there. But all of these things affect our, the public, our ability to access this coastal resource, which is the, the beach and the near shore. Um, so this is what I like to think about is sort of beach access and the struggle for how we're going to manage these really different kinds of situations in a way that is best both for the public, for the social side of the system, but also for sort of the ecosystem and the coastal environment. Um, and try to put all that together in some sort of we're going to kind of try to do that today. Um, 
but I also see that as like the goal for my career. So like, we may not get there today. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and there was a question back here, James. Oh, I thought and I blew through it. So I, which I question? Thought, uh, beaches were all public property. Oh yeah, that's a great point. It, it, indeed, they are, with some exceptions and complications, and we're going to talk about those a little bit today. Um, anything else before we jump into this? I got like 300 slides, and then we'll be done. Okay. Um, so the first question, I, think, I obviously care about this, but like, why should we care? Why do we care? And I'm guessing that this, I'm going to show you some data. This is the kind of thing we've talked about in this class, but probably with regards to other coastal resources like fisheries and estuaries and stuff. So just to, to put it in perspective, um, this is data from the National Fishing Economics Program, which is based at um, NIST, the Monterey Institute of National Studies. And they basically keep track of the ocean and coastal economy, and they've broken the ocean and coastal economy out in a variety of sectors, and you've seen this data already with Sean, but living resources, this is fisheries and aquaculture, uh, this is maritime construction, this is harbors and jetties and groins and dredging, and this is making boats and ships, uh, minerals, this is oil extraction, sand and gravel mining, Transportation is really big. This is the Port of Los Angeles, the Port of Maine. And then good old TNR, this is this is the people who come from the beach. So this is going to be data for, for how many people these different sectors of these industries employ. And this is sort of what, the, what is its contribution to California's economy. So this is just California. The entire commercial fishing sector in California, roughly $350 million. Um, Couple thousand people, not so many people, not so much money, particularly when compared to things like oil and transportation. Uh, Port of Los Angeles is one of the biggest ports in the world. It's a, it's a huge industry. You know, all the truck drivers and all the dockshore, the longshoremen, steamer doers. Um, so that's really big. But all of these essentially pay on comparison to coastal tourism and recreation. Um, to employ us tons of people from you know lifeguards to waiters at the, at the taco shop on the pier, I forget what it's called, beach house, um, and tons and tons of money. So this is a really critical part of the economy up and down California's coast. Um, and it waxes and wanes in different parts, right? So if you go up to Northern California and you go to say Shelter Cove, it's a tiny little fishing town there. Commercial fishing is more important. You go to Santa Monica as tourism and recreation. So the, the presence of a port obviously makes commercial fishing more viable, and not every town has one. But in general, at the statewide level, tourism and recreation is so important here. And if we tie that back to coastal access, they can't get to the coastal resources, whether it's the beach or the near shore, or they want to go tie or they want to put a towel down. If they can't get there, then this, some portion of this is going to go away. And indeed, a big portion of it would go away. This, the exact number depends on the multipliers, how you, how the economists do the valuation. The beaches in California contribute roughly two to seven billion dollars to the state's economy, which is no small thing. Um, and not just beaches, but also surf spots. Most hadn't been evaluated. Mavericks is on the central coast. Some economists decided that Mavericks contribute to roughly $23 million to the economy of Half Moon Bay annually. That's mostly because they have a big contest there. Now that the service big. Other places like Trestles and San Onofre State Beach, eight to $12 million. Um, and those are big and popular places, and so that's probably on the high side. But people pay money to go to their coast and be able to get there. It's an important resource. Um, but it's not just economic values, right? So you guys mentioned you looked at some kind of opinion polling with Dr. Anderson. Right, so this is some other data that shows us how important the coast is for people in the state. So these are some survey data from the P PPIC, which is the Public Policy Institute of California. They do a lot of really great statewide surveying and public opinion about everything from the coast to elections to taxes to Yosemite to, to, to come, whatever. whatever. 70% of Californians believe the coastline's condition is very important to the state's quality of life. In other words, to be in California, where as a resident, 
having a, a healthy coastline is important to almost three quarters of the people. That's that's kind of amazing. Uh, almost 90% say that the ocean and the beaches and them being clean, healthy, nice places is, is personally important to them. Does that mean that they go? Not necessarily. Does that mean that they would pay money to protect them? Not necessarily. Does that mean that they recycle? No, but still, 90% say that it's personally important. That's a, that's a pretty uh, head-turning number. And almost three-fourths will go to a beach more than one time per year. This is way more than the national average. So kind of in conclusion, people in California care about their coast. We spend a lot of money to go and use it. It's important. Um, this is another example that I love. This is Huntington Beach. Anyone from Huntington Beach? Huntington Beach, California, Surf City, USA. Um, once upon a time, Santa Cruz also wanted to be Surf City, USA. Huntington Beach sued them um, for the exclusive right to proclaim themselves Surf City, USA. Um, I was actually talking to my wife about this. I guess there's some cities. There's a city on the East Coast of Maryland. It's called Surf City. Um, so maybe this is just in California, Surf City, Surf City. USA and California, because there are some other sort of cities. But anyway, the town of Huntington Beach cared enough about sort of the identity, the cultural things that go along with surfing that they were they were, they engaged in legal action against another coastal city in California for the exclusive right to claim themselves surf city USA. So that tells you something about the importance of the coast and the beach and the waves to the people in this community. Uh, and it's also really important to other populations of people. Right? People go to the coast and they use it. One group of people that does this with extraordinary regularity is those who surf. Um, surfing is, there's, there's debates whether it's a sport. Some people think of it more of it as a way of life. Uh, this is a population of people who care really deeply about what's happening out there and they visit with astounding frequency. Did you guys get in the water this morning? No, but you thought about it. <laughs> it was right? really windy. It was really windy. Yeah. Um, just, so this is, my, this is my brother. This is me as a little kid with my dad. Uh, this is this is my little cousin, right? So surfing is is also a thing that sort of ropes people into the coast, not just in a hey that's fun, but in a kind of a multi generational way. So. I guess the purpose of these is to say that the coast is, uh, is is bigger than just a thing people care about. It is bigger than just a thing that sort of generates revenue for the economy. Uh, it's a very important part of many people's lives um, and a very important part of their family's lives. So this is something we want to understand a little better because uh, let me just show you these pictures and then I'll, I'll explain that a bit. Uh, this is... Uh, some pictures from a colleague in Peru. This is just outside the city of Lima. Um, the mayor there essentially said, we need to ride in this road without getting any permits. They started dumping riprap, um, giant boulders, on the side of the road to do this road widening project. And the people in town, the people that were on the beach that day, they were like, what's happening? We didn't know what was going to happen. They started running out of the water, chasing down the bulldozer. The police came. They started fighting with the police. Their surfers were fighting with the riot police in the water, getting taken away. So they, they weren't doing this because this particular beach and coast contributes to their local economy. They weren't doing it because 90% uh, because of Peruvians feel that the condition of their shoreline is personally very important to them. They're, they're doing this because of something that like really deeply and innately motivates them to care about this system. So you think back to what we were talking about before with the Venn diagrams and sort of the ecosystems and there's the society and the governance is in the middle. The relationship between societies and ecosystems, between societies and government is, is motivated by some things besides economic data about how important those things are. And then resource for some resources in particular, like beaches and waves and coastlines, there are there are deeper, more fundamental values that are motivating people to care about these. This is something that we want to understand a little better. I'm not, uh, this is just another example of people caring. This is in California. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, there's a coastal development project that was proposed uh, at San Onofre State Beach, where Trestles is. 
uh, since we have uh, a, a toll road at the Pearl Border, we're just going to go through the beautiful little coastal riparian corridor. And, and the people came out. This is a, a public planning meeting. California Coastal Commission. We're going to come back to them. This is the most widely attended. The most the most people attended this. More people attended this meeting than have ever attended any public planning meeting in the history of California. Right? Public planning meetings aren't particularly captivating or exciting or entertaining. Um, but this one was essentially standing room only, and there was a line down the street for quite some time. These people were opposing development in this coastal system. Right? And they're not doing this because Trestles generates eight to $12 million a year in, in economic revenue for the city of San Clemente. They were doing it because there's these other things that motivate them to care about this system. Uh, so one of the things that we did to try to understand this a little bit better is we used uh, um, a body of theory to try to understand these connections that people have with these places, uh, and this is cleverly called it, sort of place theory. But it's the idea that in the world there are sort of abstract spaces that we move through and we don't really care about, and there are meaningful places where we as complicated, sentient, social animals invest a lot of time and energy and come to care deeply about, right? So this is the difference between the Starbucks at the airport and you know, your grandmother's kitchen. And so when you develop these relationships with places, that is the kind of relationship, this kind of attachment that motivates this kind of behavior. Um, and so we wanted to see if these are the kinds of things that, that apply to people and the way that they feel about the code. Yes? Uh, this is another like, question for Salem. Is that kind of like tangible versus non tangible? Like more intrinsic important? values yeah. versus. Uh, or not so much. Yeah, I think that's one way to think about it. So, place theory as a body of sort of scientific inquiry is this really diverse thing in the people in psychology and anthropology and geography. And so, we can study from a lot of different angles. So there's a lot of different words and terminology that get drawn in from different fields to tackle it. Uh, but it is, in some ways, it is sort of more evident to help explain what makes that sort of intangible, intrinsic value have value. Um, and so we did a study to try to look at place attachment, which is you know, how bonded are people to their coastline. Uh, and as I said, these aren't sort of arbitrary, random values. These are the things that actually motivate people to do pro environmental behaviors, like pick up trash or recycle, to participate in the public planning process around resource management, um, and to pass more robust policies for managing the natural resources. So it, it's this kind of wonky academic thing, but it has these very real impacts on how people behave and so we wanted to find out sort of beaches in the coast where they, they sort of meet the threshold for people to actually care about in this way and would motivate them to do the kinds of things we see people doing to protect and care about these resources. Um, and so I'm going to kind of skip the details, but uh, actually I'll just put these all up. Um, so these are just some of the ways that people described not even their local beach, but their local surf spot. And so just take a moment to, to read them. Really interesting. What are, what are some of the things that pop out for you from this? Yeah, family, community. Right, so we think about a place like the beach or a surf spot as a place where we just go to play. But people care for some really fundamentally deep-rooted reasons that sort of go to the heart of what makes us kind of human. Things like family, community, social aspects of how we use the system. Um, yeah, so this intergenerational lifetime of investment. So anyway, that's a really interesting. So we're going to come back to that. So why start? So that's kind of so these are some of the reasons why we want to care about being able to access these resources, right? If they're economically valuable in public opinion polls, people say that they're valuable. Uh, 
And we've shown that they actually have some really like, fundamental, deep-rooted importance um, for a lot of people who use them. Uh, so why do we need to start caring about this now? Um, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I'm guessing some of the ESRM students who've seen this all already. Climate change, sea level rise, coastal development, coastal erosion. Uh, this is the oil spill just up the coast at Refugio. Uh, crazy coastal politics, right? This is these are heady times to care about the coast in California or anywhere. There's a lot going on. Most of it not so good. Um, so a lot of these questions about how do we deal with our ability to access these really important resources are really coming to a head now in a way that they haven't in the past. Uh, and if we don't grapple with them now, they are only going to be harder to grapple with uh, in the future. So just as an example, the best projections for sea level rise in California by the end of the century are roughly two feet to five and a half or six feet by the end of the century. And that's, that might not seem like much, but it's actually quite a bit. It's roughly a, a full tide range cycle above what we currently get. Um, so that's the ocean is sort of going to be rising towards us from that side. And we're also pinching it from the other side. This is population growth in California. So that's, these are all these are the 15 coastal counties in California. Um, these are the three southernmost counties, and notice that there's a, it's almost a tenfold difference in the scale between these two, um, mostly because LA is big and it's grown a lot. But that's pretty amazing, I just locally see, I just pointed this out, Ventura has been growing like crazy, Ventura County is growing like crazy. So all of this, all of these people need somewhere to go, so we've got sea level rising on one side, we've got coastal population sort of booming on the other side, pushing back towards the coast. So what the coast is basically stuck in the middle, and they call this the coastal squeeze. Um, maybe you guys have talked about this in some of your other courses. Uh, and this creates a bunch of challenges for coastal resource management and for access to those resources. Uh, by 2050, if there's a couple more million people and they all want to go to the beach too, where are we going to put them? Uh, we have another perspective on this. So this is the, the, the four feet of silver rise projection for the city of Santa Barbara. And then when these projections came out, there was all this concern about, uh, you know, here's the, the airport is going to be, the Santa Barbara airport is going to be underwater. But that's kind of a moot point. People aren't going to want to go to Santa Barbara anymore because all of the beaches, all of the beautiful sandy beaches are also going to be underwater. Right, so these, the, the, the tourism value of this place is severely threatened. The airport is going to be the least of their concerns. Uh, likewise, this is not Broad Beach, Malibu. This is also Malibu. This is just a nice sort of visual of the coastal squeeze. The development has come right to the water's edge. They didn't build there originally, but the water has come up to meet them. And the beach in this particular image has essentially been squeezed out of existence. There is no more beach. Um, so what do we do about that? Skip that. Um, so if this is the beach, and this is the surf spot just off the coast, we can do a couple things. Um, if we just let the system evolve naturally, typically what happens is that coastal sediment, coastal bluff erosion happens, renourishes, replenishes the beach, and the system, as the sea level rises, essentially maintains. And the reason that we know that this works is because 20,000 years ago, sea level was roughly a couple hundred meters lower than it is today. And for most of recorded history, there have been lovely beaches. And so we know that even as the level has come up that far, that this works because there are beaches now. The question is, what happens when we start to muddle with the system? So often if there is something here that people want to protect, whether it's a house or a hotel or a train track or a highway, like the 101, 101. We do, we meddle with the system. We do things to prevent the, the natural cycle from occurring with a result that the beach goes away, the surf spot probably goes away. And this is just what I showed you in that, that picture of Malibu just now. So, so this is a challenge that we're going to be dealing with right there in this coastal squeeze zone. So what does access have to do with this? Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about another study that we did to try to get a sense of 
how access fits in in the bigger picture for all of us here in California, and it's going to be Cindy's data before. Uh, this is more for this from Kali. But as a couple of you have pointed out already, the beach in California belongs to everyone. I'm going to come back to that. But it's increasingly out of reach to a lot of people. This is both because of things like sea level rise and coastal development and that coastal squeeze, but for others with complicated social demographic, some socioeconomic issues as well. Uh, so we truly we thought we'd try to answer this question. Is the beach actually equitably accessible to everybody that lives in this state and wants to go? It's personally important to them. How easy it is it for everybody to actually get there and use it? Um, for those of you that haven't taken GIS yet, you should. It's a powerful tool. It's what we use to try to answer this question. Um, so I'll just explain how we did this. We're going to zoom in on, on locally. We basically looked at where all the beach access points are that give people in California access to the coastline. And we drew a buffer around what were the populations that are living within certain distances of those access points, right? So we'll be able to say, who are the people that live within a kilometer of coastal access in California, who live within 10, who live in 100 kilometers of coastal access, and who live beyond that. And what that allows us to do is sort of compare the accessibility of the coast between people who live in these different areas. Um, and what the data that this analysis generates is, is terrible tables, so we're just going to, I'll just give you some highlights. Uh, one out of every 15 Americans lives in our 15 coastal counties in California. Um, I think this is a fun statistic, so I like to use it a lot. It's easy to remember. 15 coastal counties, one out of 15 Americans. So the first takeaway that, from this is, goes back to those population diagrams that I showed a couple minutes ago. There's a ton of people on the coast of California. There's more coming, one out of every 15 Americans. So that's really a phenomenal number of people. Um, and then what we can do is we can compare the people that have sort of the most access to the coast with sort of the average of the population, right? To see who has, which sort of population groups have more versus less access to the coastline. And what we find is more or less what you might observe if you were driving through, you know, Costa Mesa or Laguna Beach, um, some of these wealthy upscale coastal communities that in general, in California, the coast is sort of wider and wealthier than the state average. Um, so that's that's not a huge surprise based on what you might just observe driving around, but we can actually quantify it with this data and say how much and what is the what is the issue here is that if the coast is supposed to be equitably accessible to all of us, what does this mean for us as a state? What does this mean for the different population groups? And more importantly, what are we going to do about it? So we concluded so the access to the coastline is not equal for everybody. Sea level rise is going to make this worse, uh, presumably. Uh, Kiki Patch and I are just putting a proposal together to actually definitively answer that question. So TBD, but we think it's going to make it worse. Uh, so what are we going to do? Right? We can't just move all the people around so that all the different population groups, subgroups in California have sort of equal access. So what do you do? How do you make the coast more accessible if you can't change where people live? Well, there are there's like a few things we can do. Who's uh, gone to the beach lately? How'd you get there? I made a drive. So if you didn't have a car, bike. you could bike, or you could, for example, as a community, you could have better public transportation options to actually make the beach accessible to people that don't have other transport options and maybe don't live so close that they can bike or walk. Uh, what else? What'd you do when you got there? Where'd you put your car? Yeah, to look for a parking place, right? So sometimes, like, that's an easy thing that you can do to make the coast more accessible to give people a place to park when they get there um, and to make that parking easy uh, and affordable. Uh, Sonoma County was increasing the fee price of um, the parking lots in their county. And, you know, they're going from like $5 to $10 or 5 to 15 or 5 to 8 and they, the differences are small, but they can make a really big difference in some communities. And so we can't change where people live, 
to make the coast sort of more equitably accessible. But we can recommend to coastal community other things that they can do to increase the accessibility of their coastline. So that the people in California, you pay money to take advantage of this important coastal resource. You might travel really far to get there. Who, 90% of which think that its health is personally important to them. We want to give them more opportunity and a more equitable opportunity to access this resource that belongs to them. So, and we're, just, we're almost done here, and then we can get power mad and go. Uh, so the problem is, is that this is going to get harder and harder to do. So we can we can implement these things, but the coast itself is is kind of in a pickle. It's squeezed between sort of our desire as a state to make it accessible to people, whether it's through coastal development that serves visitors, or whether this is a coastal power plant, or private homes, or a road, um, and the coast itself. And so we, as a state, have to make decisions about what we're going to do in this situation in order to balance between these two things. Right? So this is the struggle for balance. We're balancing the needs of a coastal society that has to do things like have economic activity and roads and businesses and industry, and this coastal resource that we all think is really great and we like to visit and play at. And how do we choose which of these things we're going to prioritize if having both is challenging, if not impossible? Uh, well, in California, the Constitution's on our side in some sense. So this California Constitution says that no one to be permitted to exclude the right of the public to access the water that shall always be attainable to the people of California. So that's pretty cool. Our state constitution basically says that the beach belongs to us and no one can stand in our way. So if you think about this, maybe it means that it kind of shifts the balance of the struggle in favor of protecting and conserving the beach itself. That's good. Uh, Better yet, that piece of the Constitution is built on a very ancient common law legal doctrine called the Public Trust Doctrine, um, which I like to talk about in my land use class, which you can take next fall. Public, public Trust Doctrine is this really important thing. It basically says not only does the Constitution say that no one can present, pre prevent us from accessing it, but the Public Trust Doctrine says that the coast belongs to us. It doesn't just belong to us, it, it literally, we own it, we the public own the coast. And it's the government's job to hold it in trust and manage it to our, for our benefit. So anything that the coast, the government is going to do along the coast ostensibly has to be for the public benefit. So there's places obviously where government agencies or entities prevent us from having access. Anyone try to go to the beach point of view lately? I know there's a naval air station there. They don't, they don't necessarily want you wandering around on that beach. The military gets some exemptions for this. Other times, the state might grant a place like um, Port Winnebe to build a harbor, right? So they are changing the coast substantially. They're going to change our ability to access that particular chunk. The coast essentially gave our coast to that city to build a port. But that's in the public benefit, too, rather than the port. The takeaway, we'll show it twice, is that the beach, the beach out there your beach it is our beach. So putting that together, it, it really seems like the law, the governance of California is kind of in favor of us managing this complicated coastal system in favor of preserving our access to these resources. Um, but there's some challenges. One, there's the challenges we've seen, like sea level rise and population growth. But there's also this chunk of California coastal management law, which says that basically seawalls and armoring devices shall be permitted to protect existing structures. In other words, if you have something out there, some economic, some sort of development, whether it's a road or a train track or a house or a hotel, the law says that. If you need to protect it by building a seawall, which as we've seen might make the beach go away, it shall be permitted. Is that like a maybe? Is that like a kind of? Or is it like a sometimes? It's a shall, uh, which is pretty definitive language 
to put in a law. So if you are at the Coastal Commission and you get the permit application, do you do you get to debate it? Do you get to say, well, maybe not this time? Nope. Got to get a permit. So this is an interesting challenge. And so when you kind of wrap that in, it sort of seems like the Coastal Act and sort of the fact that we have all this development, that the law, the implementation of law, is going to be biased in favor of protecting all of this at the expense of the coast. That's kind of a problem. And so it really, we are in this pickle of balancing between the coast itself, which is why we have a hotel here in the first place, and protecting the coast itself. So this is just uh, sort of a heuristic to think about it. But this struggle for balance between these two things is going to play out pretty much up and down the entire coast, everywhere you can think of, where there is something behind the beach that people might reasonably want to protect for its own use, utility, intrinsic value, et cetera. So this struggle is going to be playing out continuously all over our coastline, all over pretty much all of the coastlines for the foreseeable future. And so in some places like California, we've got the, the, some complexity, uh, some potentially some uh, some conflict in the, the laws that are the way the law is written to deal with this. In other places, they have other governance institutions. Maybe they're dealing it differently, dealing it differently based on the values of their local coastal societies. Question. Um, yeah, that's somewhat like the four years they have it's still public access, but I think I'm aware that like there's still access to the beach, but it seems like you have to be permanent and necessarily Maybe access, or is that still like whether access to the Yeah, so uh, the so if a campground, and I don't know the system, the full situation down there, but the the freedom of access, the, the public trust doctrine, does not apply necessarily to the campground, but it applies to the beach below it. So even at Broad Beach, Malibu, where you go, and there's signs that, that like at the back of the beach that say this is private. There, that's true above a certain point, but below that point, the beach is, is free and open to all, and you can walk up and down into two cars. Uh, one thing we've got going for us in California is we sort of deal, think about how to make this, sort of deal with this, grapple with this balancing act. There's another little chunk of the, our coastal management law, which basically says when we have these conflicts, we must uh, resolve them in the manner which is on balance the most protective of significant of resources. And so that's that's that sounds like a good thing, but if we've got all these people that are moving to the coast and we've got fewer beaches because of sea level rise, what happens when all of these people start going to the same beach? That actually could start becoming a problem. Remember back to that picture from the very beginning where the beach was almost like no sand left. So if you're a sandy beach ecologist and you care about you know the Pacific Coast flyway with all the migratory birds and you care about mole crabs or the crazy invertebrates that live in kelp rack. If the beach is totally covered with people, those, there's a problem there. And so it could be that significant coastal resources might be the beach itself, and protecting them might actually mean reducing access. So this is, this is an interesting conflict, and this is an ongoing conflict, and we don't have all of the answers to how we're going to deal with this. Uh, but what we do have are some institutions, some laws, and some agencies which are how we make decisions at present about what to do about it. And how that governance is implemented is informed by sort of what's happening in the ecosystem, what its needs are, how we use it, and how we affect it. And then the large things that are happening in coastal society. And so a great example of that is the Coastal Act, which is sort of the, the, the key preeminent chunk of coastal management law in California, was created by a ballot proposition. So the people of California said, <clears throat> We can't wait for the legislature. Our coast is so important. We need to do a better job managing it. So the people of California voted this proposition into law. So that was the values of California in 1972. They've changed. The state has changed. The coast has changed. How we do this cycle to balance between the coast itself and how we're using it, this is an ongoing ongoing thing. And I think that's really summed up in this quote from Peter Douglas, who's 
one of the authors of the original Coastal Act, and he ran the Coastal Commission for a great many years. He says the coast is never saved, the coast is always being saved. Right? So this is, a, this is an ongoing, continuous process. There is no end point. And this balance between what we need, what we want, how we're using the coast, how we access the coast, this is going to get harder and harder as there are more people to, to deal with and there is uh, less beach as well comes up. So um, that's all that I had. That's how you can find me. And um, I'm happy to chat about this. But if you all want to go charging out the door, that's cool too. Uh, thank you for your attention. Just that guy. <laughs>